Okay. Yes. Right, so if you want to, if you have a .py file and you want to say, boy, what does this do? Um, I'm assuming that it comes from a trusted source and it's not doing like rm star dot star. Um, you want to just type Python and then the name of the file. If you type IPython in the name of the file, what it'll try to do is execute what's in that script and then sort of dump you back into the interpreter. If you type Python in the name of the file, it will just execute that script. Um, as if you had a .pl file and you type Perl something .pl. Um, so if you want to actually execute that file just by itself without having to type Python in front of it, you have to put some special thing on the first line and give the permissions of that file to be an executable. Um, by the way, I, I should say, I, I think we made mention of this in a couple of different places um, as we were announcing the boot camp. We're really not expecting to teach you CS concepts or sort of deep Unix concepts um, in the class. Uh, so if those wind up coming up, um, please sort of t uh, ask one of the counselors offline about what does it mean to have a for loop. Or hopefully, you're, hopefully all of you are sort of beyond that point. We don't expect that you're proficient in C or Perl or Fortran or whatever. Um, but uh, having had some experience with a modern computing language um, is really in some sense, a prerequisite of this. I, I think that's been made explicit, but I just wanted people to be um, clear kind of what we are and, 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 and aren't going to be teaching. Is there a question up there? Yeah. If I'm running PyLab, will that be much different to your iPad? No, it shouldn't be. Um, you know, the, the, when there's a difference, you'll get an error, and then it'll say, I don't know how to do that. And then you'll say, OK, I'll have to jump into something else. But it should be OK. All right, so obviously, we have to do a hello world. We're going to do some calculator stuff, some string stuff. We're going to learn about variables, basic control uh, statements. And what's strange about Python, these are one of the quirks of Python, is you have to be really careful with indentation. So that's, that's really foreign to most of you probably if you don't know Python. You actually have to be very careful about where you are with your indentation. So different code blocks are demarked with different uh, levels of indentation. Um, all the modern uh, text editors will be very good and graceful for you and sort of guess where you meant to be. So if you just type tab, it'll take you to the right um, indentation level. Um, we'll see more of that later on. Um, okay, hello world. I'm going to be showing you Python code. Uh, so um, if you want to follow along, you can basically look at the uh, sort of printout of the IPython notebook, which is more or less the representation of the code that I'll be showing you. I think it's not all of it, but it's uh, most of it. Um, and uh, if you want to, you can type along. In fact, you're encouraged to type along. I'm going to go somewhat fast at the beginning here just to get through some of the basics. But for, like by all means, have a Python interpreter next to you and type what I'm typing so that you start building up that muscle memory. OK, here's C++, Fortran, and Java. These are the simplest ways to say hello world. Um, here's uh, C++, I then have to compile it, and then I can say hello. Uh, here's Fortran, I can compile it, say hello. Here's Java, I can just run Java on it. Um, this is a compiling of the Java, and I can say hello world. These are examples of compiled languages. How many lines of code? Five, uh, you know, five, five. Here's Python, so we're already winning by a factor of five. Um, there should be a file. If you go to um, the uh, python uh, bootcamp.info slash agenda uh, um, URL, you will get a tarball with, that includes um, the files that I'll be uh, showing in this, in this module here. So hello.py hello is one of them. If you haven't pulled that over or you're not yet on the web, you can just open up a text editor and call it hello.py and just write print hello world exclamation point. And quit out of that. And then from the command line, type python hello.py. Sort of an example of what somebody was asking earlier. What if I have a .py file? Hello world. So that's sort of the scripted way of doing that, because we put all of the commands that we want to execute um, into, uh, into a script. 
something.py, and then we run the interpreter on that script. There's the interactive way of doing it, which is typing Python without anything after that at the command line. And then in the, at this Python prompt, which you usually see with these three carrots, say print hello world, and then you get hello world. Um, or, oops, you can do um, within the notebook, uh, you can type IPython space notebook, get into a new notebook, um, and then on the first line there, type print hello world, and then you press, um, uh, on the Mac, you press command return. I think it's the same thing on a, on a Windows box, and that basically will execute that, what's so-called cell, this little gray box here. So you've got both an, an interactive way to develop code, and you've got sort of an executable script way to develop code. Usually if you're writing more than, say, five or ten lines of code, you wouldn't do it within an interpreter. You might actually just write it down, run it, see if it behaves the way that you think it should behave. What's really nice is that what you do interactively, so what I do up here, I can just cut and paste back into a script. So if I actually do develop a lot of code, say, in a notebook or in an IPython interpreter, and I like it, and it works, I can just cut and paste it back into a script, and then that becomes part of the bigger, um, that becomes bigger, part of the bigger uh, workflow. Okay, let's start using Python as a calculator. So if I um, go into uh, Python, so here I'm not doing, you'll know I'll, I'm in IPython when it says in and then some bracket and then some number. Um, here I'm just in the normal plain vanilla Python. So if you type print two plus two, should get four. If I just type two plus two without the print, I will also wind up getting four. Because what Python, what the Python interpreter is saying is, okay, this is some sort of expression that you want me to evaluate, I'll do that. And then the response from that is some number. I'm guessing that you pretty much want me to print that out. If you ran that from within a script, uh, and you just said two plus two within your hello.py, and you just run Python, um, you won't get it printing out to the standard out. But because you're in an interpreter, it's saying, ah, standard out wants to receive stuff, standard out now has a four, I'll push it out to that. This is really weird if you're used to C, let's say. Print 2.1 plus two. I'm printing a float uh, added to, or a, a, an integer added to a float. Do you think it's gonna complain or is it gonna do something graceful? Graceful, yes. So, yeah. Um, so, to do comments, you do a hashtag, and um, instead of a semicolon, you know, or whatever, it's hashtag is, are the comments for Python. We'll see some of that later on. Okay, this is interesting. Python, this is part of the dynamic typing. Python said, okay, you have a float and an int. The sort of smallest byte or bit representation of the of the answer is going to be um, also a float. And so I think you probably just meant to just add two floats together. So there's like this implicit casting of the number two to a 2.0. This uh, double equal sign is, um, is basically a question about truth. Is it saying, is 2.1 plus two equal equal to 4.0999996? Yes. Um, why is that? Does anyone have an explanation for why that might be? It's a machine precision thing, right? You only have um, sort of 16-bit representation of, um, of your floats, and so this number is equivalent to this number as the machine can save it in memory. So some of the things that I said, we don't have to really think about memory, some of this still creeps in a little bit. Now, if you needed a very high precision, you need a precision to thousand decimal places, there are ways to do that with Python, but you have to sort of get some special magic going. But the native sort of built-in way of thinking about it is that you're still kind of limited in the ways that C is limited in that you only have a 16-bit representation of numbers um, in memory. And true here, by the way, is an a, a, a actual type of variable called a Boolean. And we'll see more of that later on. So there are ints and floats, but there are not natively doubles in Python. Again, you can get access to sort of larger bit representations, 
32-bit or 64-bit or 128-bit representations of numbers um, very easily, but we're, we're just not going to deal with that for right now. Indentation matters a lot. So type 2 plus 2 at your command line prompt. Type space and then 2 plus 2 and then press return. And it should complain at you. Something It should look something similar to this. And the nice thing about Python is it says, here's why you messed up. You have an indentation error and you have an unexpected indent. And so you can say, why is that? And it gives you a little carrot and says, here's where the first problem cropped up. The interpreter said, OK, I'm, I'm about to try to execute this line. Oh, wait a second. This line is not what I was expecting. What is the problem? And it throws the so-called um, error. So here's a handy error message. And so if you write now just two without the space after the prompt, and then some hashtag, and then you can write a comment after that, that comment is not printed. Here's a comment. So this is essentially a no-op. I can say to the interpreter, here's a comment. It says, ah, you've got a hashtag here. I'm not going to even look at what you've got after that. There's nothing for me to do. OK? Um, so there are other types of, uh, of uh, numbers um, that are built into Python. One is a long, and one is a complex. And again, the way to think about it is in memory, there's sort of larger uh, bit representations of numbers that you might use in your daily life. And the way that you declare a number to be a long, an int to be a long, is you just say, you put an L afterwards. So 2L is 2L. Type, type, type. 2L plus 2. It's akin to what we saw with the 2.1 plus 2 before. What's that going to wind up being? 4L, because it says, ah, OK, the int is small. It's smaller representation in memory than the, than the long. I think you pretty much meant to make this uh, a long. What about 2L divided by 2? That's 1. 2L divided by 2.0? 1.0, right? Because well, the, you, can, you can try to get into the mindset of what the interpreter is doing. There is an explicit sort of hierarchy that's written down at the language level. But it's pretty intuitive that if you have an integer and you divide it by a float, you pretty much want to get a float out, right? And long is just a special type of integer. You can declare a number to be a complex. Yes? Can you explain what a long is? So a long is a longer representation of an integer in, in memory than an int. It's twice, it actually is twice as many bits as, um, as an int. No, float will have up to 16-bit representation of its value in memory. Complex, you can say what the real part is and the imaginary part is. And it sort of prints it out nicely for you. Um, instead of using an i, which some of you may have seen for imaginary, it's a 1 plus 2j. So this is the real part. That's the imaginary part. 1 plus 2j, 1 plus 2j. So I don't have to declare the complex number like this. I can just say this number is equal to that. Um, what do you think 1 plus 2j minus 2j is? I mean, the answer is 1, right? 1 plus 0j. Right? So it didn't say, oh, now that you've gotten rid of the imaginary part, I think you only really want to have the real part. It's not, it really can't get into your mind that way. Um, so using this for some more interesting calculations. Uh, 3.0 times 10, that's 30, minus 25. That's 5 divided by 5 is 1. So uh, parentheses sort of explicitly tell Python the order in which you do things. Yes? So uh, I try to buy a couple of things like the same So you try to define a complex with a lot? And what did it do? Ah, interesting. Um, so everyone hear that? He tried to define a complex long, essentially. Um, I believe in NumPy there is a way to do complex long, so longer representations of the real and the imaginary part. But the, the built-in obviously just cast it and said, no, complex can be this big, right? And you try to make it longer than that, I'm going to truncate it. 
Yeah, I think it's two 16-bit numbers that are put together. Okay, so we can have exponential notation, 3.085 exponent, so 10 times 10 to the 18 times 10 to the 6. That, by the way, is a megaparsec in units of centimeters. If you're an astronomer, you know this number very well. 3.085 exponent um, plus 24. Here, we're, defi we're defining a variable for the first time. Yes? Two L plus two. Uh, okay, so when you and you printed it out. Yeah, so when it's when it's printing out from the interpreter, um, you it won't actually unless you tell it show me the the fact that this is L. Sorry, when it printed out from the script, it won't. Act, it'll just show you the string representation of that. When I've been showing you what's happening here. It's this, it is the visualization of it, but it's not the string representation of it. All that stuff will become a little more clear, but that's maybe a little bit unexpected, um, but it actually makes sense after we play with this for a little bit. Um, here I'm setting a variable, t equals 1.0. We think of t now as time. Acceleration in meters per second squared, um, 9.8 meters per second squared is the acceleration on the surface of the Earth. <coughs> Distance traveled in time, uh, t seconds is one half a times t raised to the second power. And so if I want to know what the distance is, I've declared t to be 1.0, acceleration to be 9.8, and now I can get t squared by multiplying t times t. And 0.5 is a uh, half. So I can print out that distance, I get 4.9. Another way to do this exact same thing would be to multiply the acceleration raised with the double star, that basically raises something to the exponent, t squared, and then divide this whole thing by two. You notice I'm not really, really careful about the order in which this happens, because I don't really care whether I have acceleration divided by two, and then I multiply the result by t uh, raised to the second power. Yes? Do you define a variable in the terminal? Does it persist until you close that terminal? Yes. Yes, you can type del, D-E-L, in the name of the variable, and it will, it will sweep it out of memory. So I've declared dist1 equals this thing here. Print that, that's also 4.9. And then I can use a so-called built-in function. So pow um, is, says take t and raise it to the power of 2. All these things are going to wind up being equivalent with each other. This is something I mentioned at the beginning, but it worth sort of bearing out. Variables are assigned on the fly. So I didn't have to declare t is, t is upcoming, and I'm going to call it a float. I just said t is a float, or t is this. Um, when you uh, do multiplication, division, exponents, etc., this is pretty intuitive. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, perhaps syntax you haven't seen before. But it should be pretty clear, you know, when you divide something, when you raise something to a certain power, how to do this. If not, just start playing around with it. And if you don't get uh, what you expect out, um, let us know. When you do division, it returns the floor of the answer when you do integer division. So 6 divided by 5. Yes? Sorry, how do you have least the variables? Um, sorry, to get the, the value of, the, of all the variables. Uh, let's see. Let's see. No, it's not an LS. Um, does anyone remember? WHOS. Okay, yeah. WHOS. I never use it then. Is that right? No. It's gone? There's something with underscore underscore built ins. What's that? Whose works for you? Okay. Should we just try it? Oh, right, that's, yeah, okay, so let's try an IPython. Um, you notice in IPython, these are, these are called mag magics, um, these little percent signs. Um, 
and uh, we'll see more of the different magics that you can do within IPython. There is a way to do that within Python, but I'm forgetting. I, I think it's underscore underscore built-ins. Okay, six divided by five is one point something. And so if I'm getting the floor back, I'm gonna get one. Nine divided by five is one point something. I should get back one, okay, for both of those. The mod operator is this percent sign, so six mod five. That's also one, right? So it's the remainder after I uh, remove out the floor. Um, the shift operator is this uh, carrot, um, either pointing to the left, two carrots pointing to the left or to the right. So the way to think about what I've done right here is I move the number one by two bits to the left. So I take one, I move it two bits to the left. That makes a new number in base two. So what value is one, zero, zero in base two? Four, right? Okay, so that's zero, one, that's two, and that's four. Likewise, if I take the number five, think of its bit representation, that's one, zero, one, and I move it one to the right. So I lose, I basically push everything off to the side that I lost here, so I'm gonna lose this one, I'm gonna have a one, zero. That's two. I can declare two variables in the same line with a semicolon. Actually, I can have basically two statements or executable statements here separated by the semicolon. You get multiple versions of that. It's not considered good coding style to do that, but usually if you're just prototyping something and you just want to have a tiny, small uh, few lines, you can just say x equals 2, y equals 3. I can do a bitwise or, so it takes the bit representation of the number 2, which is in base 10, and the bit representation of, um, of y, also in base 10, and I can do an or on those, basically bitwise, and I get the number three, right, obviously. Um, I can do an exclusive or, so here's uh, the bit representation of x, the bit representation of y, and I only have a value which is one if at each bit level the numbers are different from each other. And that's done with this, um, with this uh, upward facing caret. So that's the number one. Um, likewise, I can do an and. I get the number two, right? Because this three is one, this three is one, one, and this two is one, zero. If I do an and on that, well, this last, uh, this last place here is different, so I get a zero, and here I wind up getting a one in the second place. What do you think happens when I do this? I'm saying x is equal to basically whatever comes out of this, and I'm going to print x. <coughs> 1. I just reassigned x on the fly, right? And if I had actually sort of casted this value to a float, I would not have gotten a complaint that all of a sudden I had this, what used to be an int, and it's now a float. Um, you can do a couple of nice um, inline operators where you say, to the value of x, um, add 3 to it. So what's going to happen when I do that? What is x currently? It's 1. So if I add 3 to that, it's 4. If I divide by 2, so I'm basically saying the same thing of here. x is equal to x divided by 2. And I'm just doing this in a shorthand way. OK? Normal division? Oh, it's a float. It's a float division. And again, x x before this point was an integer. Now it's a float. Um, we'll see more of the sort of math stuff um, throughout the boot camp, but I just want to get you kind of ramped up. Um, okay, so let's do some relationship testing. Um, remember, from before we had a couple different ways of doing distance. We both set both of those to four point nine. So distance one is equal to distance, equals equals distance. That is true or false? True. Distance is less than 10? That's true. Distance is less than or equal to 4.9? That is also true. 
distance is less than some complex number, Python says, uh, I don't know how to do ordering when you're comparing those two different types. So that's sort of natural, right? It would know how to do ordering. In this case, um, here I had basically an ordering of an int and a float. And it said, oh, I know what you mean by that, because those have numerical values. They're all on the same number line. But now you're basically asking to compare essentially apples and oranges. And Python says, sorry, I don't know how to do that. I wasn't taught how to do that. Distance is less than minus 2, false. Distance is not equal to 3.1415, true. OK, so you have a bunch of different examples here of how to test um, relationships. You can actually wind up seeing that this works in the context of strings. Um, but you know, usually, you don't want to do comparisons of strings this way. If you want to do sorts on strings, um, you might want to think about sort of, uh, these sort of um, uh, relationships. Let's do some special types and some special numbers. Zero equals equals false. So what is it? Python said, look, zero is an int, false is a Boolean. I assume what you really want to do is test whether these two things are the same. So I'm going to cast one of them to the other um, type, and I'm going to do the comparison in that space. What's not false? Basic logic, people, it's true, OK. Um, zero <coughs> dot zero, so a float representation of zero is equal to equal to false. That's also true. Yes? Um, what's happening that the, the false is cast to an integer type? Um, I think the false is cast to an integer, or in this case, a float type. Yeah, in this case, it's cast to an integer. Yeah, so this is, we're getting in a little bit of a dangerous territory because you can do comparisons of different types to other types. You can get in a little bit of trouble um, if you're not very careful with what you're comparing, right? Because if you get to the point in your code where you're saying effectively some variable whose value currently is equal to zero is false, pretty much don't want to be doing that. Um, but I just want to give you some sense of this. What's not 1.0 minus 1.0? True. Not minus one. False. <coughs> Not 3.1415. Again, this doesn't make any logical sense to ask that question, but it's sort of good to get an intuitive sense of how Python's thinking about this. False. X is equal to none. This is a special name. Capital N-O-N-E. Um, it has neither a true value associated with it or a false value associated with it. So effectively here, you wind up seeing that numbers and floats have truth associated with them. That's just what Python decided. None is equal to, e is equal to false? No. None is equal to true? No. So if you have a variable whose value is none, it is neither true nor false. True or false? True. True and false and true. Sounds like we're writing a love song. Um, um, don't worry if you don't get all of it immediately. Just start typing stuff on the commands. What happens if I do this, right? And then you'll start building up sort of an intuitive sense of that. Uh, more on variables and types. Okay. We have a special function. It's a built-in function called type. Um, I have a special function called uh, um, type, and I can ask, what is the type of 1? It is of type int. What is the type of uh, 2? So here, I actually didn't give it the number. I said, what's this variable? This variable is equal to x. x currently is an integer. Type 2 is equal to type 1. That's true. So if you're given a variable and you don't know if it's of a certain type, you can ask this statement before you go on to it, right? So if you're given something that may or may not maybe a string, maybe a number, you could essentially ask this question and then decide how you're going to deal with that variable um, accordingly. Print uh, the type of true. 
That's a bool. Print the type of a type of one. It's a type type. <laughs> Try to do that recursively. Um, type pow. Remember we saw pow before when we raised t uh, to the second power? That is a built-in function or method. That's kind of a nice way to do some introspection on what you're given. If you're going through line by line in some code that's foreign to you, you're not quite sure where this thing came from, you might be able to get into that and start asking these questions. <coughs> yes? So I'm, I'm doing that uh, because within the notebook, if you don't do that, like in the case up here, it won't actually print out the result, or it'll just say int. Because if I want to know, um, if I want to know basically the string representation of the response from type of x, some interpreters will just say int, and some will say bracket, you know, or caret um, int. But you don't have to do that. This is just to be very explicit of that I want to have it printed out. Um, instead of having to say, you know, if I have this new variable, is it of a type int, I can just ask this question with another built-in function called isInstance. And I can say, is one an instance of uh, type int? Yes. Is um, spam an instance of type string? Yes. Uh, is 1.212 an uh, instance of type int? No. Okay. There are lots of different built-in types. Um, we've seen pretty much all of these in some ways already, um, but we're going to wind up seeing more and more of these built-in types as time goes on. Um, you don't always have to understand you know, what exactly the type is that you're dealing with, but if you're comparing ints and floats, you're probably OK. If you're comparing ints and bools, that's sort of danger territory. Comparing ints to strings is usually not a good idea at all. And you know, if you've got an error in your code, uh, it will it will barf at you, and it will tell you why it can't do what you've asked it to do. So let's start looking at strings. Um, they're a sequence of characters. They can be indexed and sliced up as if they were an array. Um, you can glue strings together with plus signs. And um, the important thing about uh, strings is that they are considered immutable. So once I say A is equal to, quote, spam, I can't go in and start changing that, uh, you know, the actual internals of that string. I can make a new string called A with a change to the original version of A, but I can't go in and say in the fifth element, remove that, pop that out, and stick a new one in. You can have special methods which will do that. These are functions that basically operate on that string, but I can't directly go in as if it was some sort of array and just change stuff in place, in memory. Um, they can be compared, they can be formatted, Obviously, you're going to be doing a lot of stuff with strings in your daily life. So let's um, start playing with strings a little bit. X is equal to spam. And remember the semicolon? That allows me to essentially have two statements on the same line. Print type of X. Let's type string. Print hello backslash n my sire. Hello, my sire. Backslash n is a special character. It says, do a return um, uh, as it's printed out. If I just type hello backslash n my sire, which is basically just declaring a string and not doing anything with it, the Python interpreter will just say, OK, this is, this is that string. So here you see a little bit more explicitly, there was a question over there earlier on. You see a little bit more explicitly the difference between saying print and just basically um, having something which could have been printed out with this backslash n and actually formatted it right. Um, OK, so now this is some interesting things about declaring strings and the usage of strings. If we have a double quote uh, here and we have a single quote here, everything inside of both of those is identical. So is this true or not? That is true. Because the act of adding these quotes around ASCII characters um, is uh, the sort of creation of that string. And everything inside of that uh, is what will be called the string. Everything that sort of starts it and ends it will not be considered part of that string. Um, what if I said double quote on the outside and then single quote on the inside? Well, this sort of makes sense. The double quotes are, are at the beginning are the things that create that string. 
Any other types of quotes inside of that will not be considered creating or ending a string. And so that will sort of come out the way we think it should. Yeah? yeah I'm using a, a phrase with a slice, uh, um, Double quotes? Double quotes, so same result. Uh, same result of what? Maybe breaking. So yeah. what should there, there shouldn't be any. That's the point. There shouldn't be any difference between that and that. The, the, the actual representation in memory of that string is exactly the same. And I just declared it and created that representation slightly differently. So it works as an alternative. Yeah. You could, and you know, I don't think there's actually a, a de facto standard for how to, how to do it. I personally like to use double quotes on the outside, but many people will just use a single quote. What if I do, what if I actually really want to have a double quote? I can have a special character, which is a slash, which says the next thing after that um, is also going to wind up being special. And so I can print this out, and I actually get the double quotes inside. Typically, I think this is confusing to look at. If I knew that I wanted to have a double quote in my string, what I would usually do is I would start the string with a single quote and do all my double quotes on the inside. OK? So. Backslashes start special escape characters. Um, slash n is a new line. Slash uh, r is a return slightly different from each other. Slash t is a tab. So well, actually, if you're trying to create, say, a tab separated file, you would do a slash t. And this is considered essentially one single character, even though it actually is two different strokes on a, on a keyboard. And backslash a is a bell. So try to do, um, in your interpreter, try to type, say, uh, you know, print, double quote, something, slash n, and then something else, and then you'll wind up getting, um, hopefully that printed out. And then what I'll ask everyone to do is do a slash a, do a print, and then double quote, slash a, slash a, slash a. And everyone, wait for it, I'm going to synchronize you all. Type it into your, your see if you guys are all actually typing. Ready? And press return. That's um, the, the nerd Python symphony. Yeah, was there a question over there? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering whether or not, um, since you have these operators, what is the case you wanted to actually have this print out backslash n? Then you would do another backslash. Okay. So let, I mean, let's we can give that a, we should give that a try. So here's my backslash b. Oh, it didn't actually, oh, I don't have it plugged in. Um, let's do, you wanted to do a backslash n? OK. We're going to see a lot more of string formatting and things uh, tomorrow. Um, OK, so uh, there's also a way of doing what you just asked with the concept of a raw string. And that's where you put an R in front of the, um, the beginning of the, of the string. So here I have R and then um, single quotes. This is a raw string with new lines, and they're ignored. Right? So that would be another way to do what you just asked. Triple quotes are very, very useful. Um, and you can have them with single triple quotes or single double, or sorry, triple double quotes. So if I say four score and seven minutes ago, you folks all learned some basic mathy stuff with Python, and boy, were you blown away. So you notice I can just have multiple lines where I just continue this all in the, as one string. If I print that out, I get what I expect. So if you've got you know, a manifesto that you need to somehow print out many times over, um, hopefully you're not that kind of person, but you want to do that, you want to send this to a million people, perhaps you just want to type out your manifesto in one Python string, you can just start it all with triple uh, single quotes or triple double quotes, and then end it with the same, and then you've got it. Prepending an R makes that string so-called raw. Triple quotes allows you to compose long strings. And if you put a U in front of it, it makes it Unicode. And if you don't know what Unicode is, don't worry about it. Um, OK, so let's start playing a little bit with some string manipulation. Um, S is equal to spam, E equals eggs. S plus E, spam eggs. So this means I can, this is sort of a, a string 
knows how to add itself to another string. And the way we think about it is essentially concatenating the two strings together. Print S plus double quote space and space double quote plus E. Well, I have one string variable here, one string variable there, and I've got a new string that I just created in the middle, spam and eggs. Print green space plus E plus N backslash N plus S. Green eggs and spam. S times 3 plus E. Well, you know, if there's a concept of adding, there should also be a concept of multiplication. So this is adding essentially three times. So S times 3 plus E, spam, 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 X. This is kind of nice because, you know, oftentimes you're running some code and you want to see when a new loop has started. You want to see all, everything inside of that loop um, and how that's working. Uh, let's put a... Let's put a star here, multiply that by 50. I get a nice little uh, representation of kind of a line break in ASCII format. Print spam is good. Print spam is spam. Is, that's something new. This is saying essentially <laughs> equals equals in the context of a string. Spam is not good. Spam is spam. So false and true. Because the results of the evaluation of both of these are booleans. Spam is less than zoo? Yes? What's that? Uh, I think it does. I, I, you don't often, you wouldn't normally use it. So it's, I say one equals, one equals two. Um, so spam less than zoo? Yeah, because you know, there is some way of comparing strings, and the way that this works uh, with Python is it winds up looking at the first character, and it says, is the numerical value associated with that character, essentially, in a sense, the ordering in the alphabet, less than it is um, than Z? And the answer is yes. And it says, nope, done. Is S less than spam? So, of course, the first characters are, are identical to each other. And the answer is yes. And the way you might think about this is, well, the first are, this, are the same, but then it's got more stuff on the right-hand side after that, and this doesn't have that. So, yeah, it's less than that. Again, if you get to this point where you're doing that types of comparisons and you don't really know what you're doing, um, something's wrong. Okay, so what are the lessons here? You can concatenate strings with plus signs. You can do multiple concatenations with the star sign, and strings, indeed, can be compared with each other. Okay, so this is pretty clear. It's breakfast time. I want three eggs and no spam. Ah! What happened? What's that? Three is an in, and I did not actually explicitly cast it. So when sometimes when you're in comparisons, Python will say, okay, I think you really meant to cast this to this. But in this case, it's saying, no, I, I really don't know what you mean by three here. Um, and of course, the way to get around this is to cast the number three to a string, or explicitly just say, quotes, three. But here I have some number, and I cast it directly to um, a string. This, I believe, would work, and the similar thing would work in Java. But So Java is actually a little bit nicer in dealing with um, mixed types like this uh, in the context of strings. But now I want three eggs and no spam. That worked. Pi is equal to 3.14159. By the way, there is the actual representation, 16-bit representation of pi in the so-called math library. We'll see that later on. I want 3.1415 eggs and no spam, so I can also cast floats. OK, string true, so I'm going to cast the Boolean variable uh, of, type, of value true to a string. And you can imagine what that is. I'm going to add a, a colon. I want. And then I'm going to cast the number of pi to a string. So true, I want 3.1415 eggs and no spam. You must concatenate only strings. Coercion or casting other variable types to a string is an imperative here. Any questions about that? Yeah. OK, that's a good question. The string with the parentheses, can I use that for anything? Uh, the answer is yes. 
I think everything in Python has a string representation of itself. Even complex objects, even complex variables have a string representation of it. Um, and it won't always be pretty. Um, there's also something instead of str, which is called repr, which is um, really uh, sort of a coerced version of a string that says, I want however you can represent yourself no matter what, even if it's ugly. Um, I believe most objects and most things in Python have a string representation of itself. Um, and so it, you won't usually throw an error if that happens. But repr, if you really need to see what that thing is, is um, a little bit safer than, than str. All right, so let's start interacting with uh, Python. We'll get some input from the user. The important point of this lesson is going to be that whatever the user types in, even if they type in a number, it is always a string. And the way you do this with a built-in called raw underscore input. This is where the IPython notebook doesn't work. So you can work within IPython or you can work within Python, but the version that you have of an EPD of, I think, 0.12 and IPython uh, does not work um, sort of with this sort of back and forth with the user. So I'm going to assign a variable to whatever comes back from me with the raw input um, call. And as part of that, I'm going to ask for a temperature in Fahrenheit. Again, you can cut and paste from the PDF or from the, from the PDF of the notebook or from the, um, uh, from the PDF itself of this, uh, of this lecture. So you don't actually have to type the whole thing out. But I do want you to get a sense of what this looks like um, in front of you. Now I'm going to say, well, the centigrade value of that is just uh, 5.9 divided by 9.0 times the Fahrenheit minus 32. So if I typed in the number 71 here, I told you that wasn't going to work because every, even though all this makes sense and this number is 71, this number is actually a string. And just like when you're trying to print out a string and you're trying to concatenate strings and you stick a float or, a or, a, or an int on it, it says, I don't know how to do that. Likewise, you're not going to be able to do math with strings. So it says, I don't know how to deal with a string and a float. And it's actually told you there's a minus sign here. I don't know what, how to do this. So instead, let's cast uh, the uh, value of Fahrenheit to a float. And let's just put it back in the, um, in the uh, variable called Fahrenheit or Fahren. And let's run it again. And we get the right answer out. Um, instead of having to do this on two lines, I could do it on one line. I take the result of raw input, and then I cast that immediately to a type float by basically saying float parentheses and close around that. Enter the temperature in Fahrenheit, and I get the answer out. By the way, if I really only want to do this in one line, I could, instead of, uh, instead of having Farron here, I could have this whole thing on the right-hand side stuck in there, and I'd get it all just in one line. What if I type in something that's not uh, coercible into a number? I get an error. Because Python says, I don't know how to do this. Um, you could play around with this and see what happens if you type the word false, right, or things like that, but pretty much, um, you have to be careful because Python is dynamically typed to make sure you're getting back what it is that you think you should be getting back. And usually the typical way of doing this is you ask questions once you've gotten this answer back. Before you start using it, you say, is this thing actually of type int or of type string? Can I try to change it into a, a type float? And we'll figure out different ways to do that. Yeah. Um, when you print the string with slash n, it'll add a new line. Yeah. Uh, so you added it back over here? Yeah, when it prompts me, I, I try to add a slash n. Oh, so that it put it down over there? Yeah. That's surprising to me. Oh, it put it, it made it for me. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, so you typed, so you did um, that, and you want me to say, okay, that's right. 
So that is the value that's inside of, that's the value that's inside of that string. Oh, I see. So you want to say a Um, that's a good question. I think it may be because A is um, comes back as a raw string and not a. Um, Did I have a space somewhere? Oh, okay. So the reason why I did that is because it was a, a raw type. <coughs> I didn't know that. I learned something new <laughs> every time I do this. Um, all right, so we don't have a lot of time left, uh, but I want to just get through. Um, I want to get through uh, our, our the way we think about um, these uh, sh these characters within um, within a string. You can think of strings as arrays, except again, they're immutable. Um, and we don't really ever have to think about the address of where that string actually uh, lives. The length of this obviously makes sense. It's four characters. The length of eggs slash n, how many characters is that? Five, not six, because slash n is considered a special character. Right? Even though I had to type six things to get to this, it's only five characters. What's the length of an empty string? Zero. What's, now with this bracket, this is a new notation, what's the zeroth element? Python is zero indexed? S. What is the minus one element? M. So minus one means start from the back and start counting inward. So when you say minus one, you're saying, give me the last element. I don't know how long it is. I don't want to know. It could be a 1,000 characters long. Minus one gives you the last one. Minus two gives you the second to last one. OK, here is the way you should think about indexing into a string. Um, so here's the word spam. It's four characters. The way we think about it is that zero points to sort of the beginning of this character, and one points to the beginning of the P. Um, if I go to zero, that is also, we think about strings as sort of wrapped on each other. This is very different than C, right? If you try to index something outside of the memory location of where uh, a string lives, you'll get some seg fault. But I can index beyond that if I want to, um, and Python deals with this fairly gracefully. If I start at zero and I go backwards, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, so you see that four and minus four and four and minus four and zero are all the same as each other. They're pointing to the same thing. Zero through one. Well, first of all, so this is basically saying it's a slicing operator. It's saying give me a piece of that, give me a piece of that string. Zero to one. So I get every character between the number zero and one. Between zero and one, I have S. So when I ask for basically a number here, and a number here, the subtraction of those two indices is the number of characters in which I'll get back. In this case, 1 minus 0 is 1. <coughs> so I get back S. From 1 to 4. So I start off at 1, and I go to 4. I get Pam. Minus 2 to minus 1, I get A. And as I said, when you slice from m to n, you'll return the absolute value of n minus m characters. So what happens if I go from 0 to 100? You're not going to seg fault. It's going to give you spam and say, ah, you didn't really mean to go that high. Yes? This, this is what you do for string, right? Yes. You can't walk off of an array. You can't, if the array has length 5 and you say, give me the 12th element, it'll say, I don't know what you're doing. It doesn't exist. 
Um, so one, and then without any number over here, it's basically going to say, start at one and give me everything after that. However far out you have to go. That's Pam. Give me everything up to two, starting from the beginning. SP. And a little clever thing to recognize is that S, this is always true, is always equal to, uh, you know, nothing um, colon N plus S N colon something for all N. Uh, we'll get a chance to play a little bit more with that. Yes? Um, to um, invert, like I'm trying to go S negative 1 colon negative 4 and try and invert it, but that's it doesn't usually work. You have to sort of think about the string is always going forward, you know, uh, to the right. Um, but you can start counting from the left. Okay, let's do some basic flow control. Um, we're a little bit over time, so I'll go through these uh, um, not super quickly, but just succinctly. Um, Python is pretty much all of what you've seen before. Uh, it does not have a case statement. Um, doesn't have go to. Um, so if you come from the basic world, go back to it. Um, it does usually, the constructs we often use is this uh, if, else if, or elif, and then else. It's got for statements, while statements. Within um, uh, these, uh, these different uh, loops here, you can have uh, breaks, which says get me out of this, or continue, which says just start, go back to the top of the loop. And flow is done within blocks. This is where the indentation actually winds up um, mattering. If you type on the command line, uh, the Python command line, x equals 1, if x is greater than 0, and then uh, add a little indentation, print yo, and you'll see it look more like this. It'll add these sort of three um, dots here. You get these ellipses that just says uh, interpreter is not yet done. It knows that you're still entering in your blocks. And then um, make sure that the else is at the same uh, block level uh, as if, and then say print dude. So one, x equals one, x is indeed greater than zero, so I'm going to execute this, and I will not execute everything within this block. So indentations is how you say what's part of each block, and then you put um, uh, usually a, uh, a colon um, after the uh, beginning of the block. So there aren't curly brackets like you have in C. Um, you don't have semicolons at the end of this. Indentation is what tells you where you are, right, in your control loop. Everyone giving that a try? Um, colons and indentations, tabs, or space. Within actually every indentation, you just have, within every block, you have to make sure that you're at the same indentation level. If you want to actually go more inside, this is legal, but it looks very ugly. So I can have multiple statements here, print dude, print whatever else, do whatever else I want. As long as I line up with this key here, I'm fine. But you normally would wind up making sure that just like I have up here, these P's wind up, um, these P's wind up basically aligning with each other. Uh, there is actually no need um, to use exactly the same number of indentations. I think internally, Google uses two spaces when they're writing code. Um, traditionally, you wind up seeing three to four spaces. Many times, you actually see tabs as the indentation block. But you need to have something that's uniform within every block. And so probably, if you have one of these um, modern text editors, it's already figuring out for you when it knows that you're working with a, with a Python script how many indentations to do. And when you're within IPython and you type tab, it'll take you an indentation block over. Let's do a couple of um, one-liners and then we'll finish up with our first breakout session. Um, print yo if one is greater than zero, else do. This is essentially a recasting of what was a five or six line um, code uh, in the previous slide. This is doing, again, this is executable pseudocode. Print the word yo if x is greater than one, otherwise print do. Okay, um, here's a small program, x is equal to one. Here's something new we haven't seen before, the while loop. Hopefully most of you have seen a while loop construction before in other languages. While true, so in some sense, every time I go back to the top of this loop, 
this statement gets evaluated, and if it remains true, then I will keep on looping. While true is always going to wind up being true. Print yo, here's that thing up here, and then I'm going to toggle back and forth. I'm going to multiply x by minus 1, so I go back and forth so it's above 0 and less than 0, above 0, less than 0. It's just going to keep on going. Try to do that. And you go, oh no, my computer is about to explode. Type control C. And that will, that will issue what's called the keyboard interrupt, and the interpreter will say, oh, OK, so you didn't want me to do this. And it will stop what it's doing. <coughs> control C is your friend. So hopefully, you won't have to use it too many times. But oftentimes, you'll have to break out of something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it does. So everything that's inside at this same indentation level is getting executed every time I go through this loop. So the first time, whatever x is equal to 1, I'm going to wind up being larger, so I'm going to print yo. And then right after that, I multiply by negative 1, so now x is equal to minus 1. I go up here, I evaluate this statement here. Oh yeah, it's always evaluating the true, keep going, and now it's going to give me something else. Multiply by negative 1. Toggle back and forth. If this x, so x e uh, times equals minus 1, was at the same level of the while, it would never toggle, and I would just keep on printing yo. I'd be like Jesse Pink. Um, for those that watch Breaking Bad. Um, so case statements uh, can be constructed with just a bunch of if-else statements. Um, so essentially, instead of having case, you just say if this x is less than 1, print t. Otherwise, if x is greater than uh, 100, print yo. And failing those uh, evaluations, print do. So this is sort of the catch-all, this last else here. And if I don't get into one of these blocks, then I'll basically get to the end over here. If I didn't have an else statement, um, that would actually be fine. Uh, but I wouldn't print anything, because neither of those would evaluate to be true. Right? You're testing. You're actually doing a little evaluation step up here. Does this evaluate to be true? Does that evaluate to be true? OK, no, fine. Important thing about blocks is that they can't be empty. So here, I did everything that I had before. Um, uh, you can see I have a comment in here and saying, if x is equal to spam for dinner, <coughs> I'll destroy the universe. Otherwise, I'm fine with that. I'm not going to do anything. Python says this is not valid Python. Every block has to have something. And there is the concept of a no-op, and that's called pass. So if you want to sort of, you're going to maybe write this code later on, and you just want to see what happens when you do this as you're kind of developing your code, um, you just put a pass inside of there, and then Python won't complain to you. So pass anywhere you just go to the Pass is just a no-op. It's just like, here you are, just keep on going. Yeah? But well, you have to have an else. I believe you could do this without an else. You could do this without an else. Here, though, is you know the idea was that I'm developing the code. I want to I want to try this out first, and maybe I'll do a whole bunch of other stuff after that. So I know I'm going to want to have a block. Okay, so in the um, directory, uh, the tarball that you can get from the website, um, there's an archive there of a bunch of different files, and when you unpack that, you'll get a file called temp1.pl. And this is really your first you know, reasonably sized Python script. And by the way, the sort of coloring that I'm going to wind up doing here will be um, uh, sort of to show you that I'm talking about a file. So this is the file temp1.py. And let's just see what this does. Let's see construct it. Set some initial variables. Set the initial temperature to be low. So I'm going to set Fahrenheit to be minus 1,000, which is unphysical. What we're going to do is we're going to just try to get some user input back and forth. And we're going to try to take actions on that user input um, as we wind up getting responses. So it's sort of bringing together a bunch of the different concepts we have already covered. I'm going to try to let the user sort of talk to us six times at most. We're going to start off with attempt zero. While Fahrenheit is less than 100, so does that execute to be true or false at the beginning? True. So it allows me to go into the while loop. Let's get some information. We've seen this before. If the new Fahrenheit value is greater than the current value of Fahrenheit, it's getting hotter, we'll print that. 
Otherwise, it's getting colder. And if it's not doing anything, we're just going to continue. Continue is different than pass. And that continue says, you get to here, no matter what, what else is below here, just go right back up to the top and evaluate again and see if you're actually supposed to be in this loop or not. Fahrenheit is equal to new Fahrenheit, so now I'm saying that the new temperature is actually what the user inputted. I'm going to bump up the number of attempts, and I'm going to say, look, if we've tried to do this too many times, we've got to get out of here. We're done. And the way you do that, the way you get out of a block is you type break, and it breaks you out of, it breaks you out of that block. Okay, so now if I have an attempt that is more than the number, maximum number of attempts, um, by raising the temperature, we'll print something. Otherwise, we'll print something else. So let's see what that looks like. Um, for those of you that downloaded this already, uh, at the command line, type python temp1.py. Um, it won't work, oh, sorry, it will work if you type run uh, temp1.py if you're within IPython. It won't work if you're within the IPython notebook. Enter the temperature, one. Well, one is greater than minus 1,000, so it's getting hotter. Two, it's getting hotter. Three, it's getting hotter. Four, it's getting hotter. Minus one, it's getting colder. 10, it's getting hotter. Too many attempts to raise the temperature. Okay. Let's try it again. Enter the temperature in Fahrenheit. Three, minus 45, 100. We got over our magic number of 100, if you remember from before. So we broke out of our while loop because we hit over 100. And so this is a, you know, a reasonable interaction. We could actually start taking actions on, on user input from this. Here's a slightly different version of this that's a little bit cleaner. And what you'll see is that there's obviously no one right way to do this within Python. Um, but uh, this is, uh, looks a little bit more elegant than what we had before. Everything looks the same, except in our while loop, we're not doing a break anymore when we say that we've hit too many attempts. We're actually, every time we're going to wind up evaluating whether we've had too many attempts, essentially in making sure that we're less than a total number of attempts and we're also over 100. Right? So this is a complex evaluation that has to happen. That entire block, that entire statement here has to uh, evaluate the true for us to not break out of the while loop. And that'll have a very similar um, interaction. In fact, it should have the same interaction as the other file. So I think that was called temp2.py. You can try both of those out. OK. So you're going to write your first code now. We're having our first uh, breakout session. You will write a program which allows a user to build up a sentence one word at a time, stopping when they enter a period, exclamation point, or a question mark. So you're going to be asking at the character level, how have you evaluated this? So here's how this might look. Enter a word in the sentence, enter dot or period, exclamation point, question mark to end. My name is, and you notice what it's doing, it's printing out the, the word as I build this up. Slim Shady, exclamation point. My name is Slim Shady, and then that's it. Okay, so um, get coding. Um, and uh, Hopefully you'll be able to draw from the PDFs and some of the files we've given you. Um, start asking questions, raise your hand. Um, don't get stuck for too long. Um, and uh, we'll hit you back when um, we, uh, we start the next uh, session.